Well, beginning last week, and on the occasion of Advent, which are the four Sundays before Christmas, we began a series of discussions. And and our purpose, our, our primary goal of these discussions was to go beyond the superficial aspects of Christmas, to to dig deeper, to see what it really means beyond what we normally recognize. And if we kind of approach that from a social point of view, I mean that we're going to go beyond the Christmas trees and we're going to go beyond the presents and Black Friday and and all those things that socially we know Christmas is. But I want to go beyond that also as a Christian. I want to go beyond the wise men, who didn't show up for two years, by the way. I want to go beyond the gifts that they gave, I want to go beyond the camels and the star in the sky, and I even want to go beyond respectfully understanding how important it is, that little baby that we recognize in the manger. I want us to dig into Christmas in ways that we have never done that before. And last week we started with the Gospel according to Matthew, the first 17 verses, and we looked at that genealogy of Christ. And we said that if we understand that genealogy of Christ, it tells us three things. It tells us that there is a new beginning for everyone each day, whenever they choose in Jesus Christ. It tells us that we can see God's promises coming to fruition. Just as Jesus came to be born of the lineage of Abraham and David, we too can believe in God that what he says will happen. And then finally, we have to believe that God gives us salvation. That there is an end for all of us, an eternity, a hope, that salvation that will never be taken away. And all we have to do, though, is accept it. Well, this week I want to talk to you about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I want to go beyond what we normally think about Mary. But before I do that, I want to kind of segue into that by telling you that this week I posted a question on Facebook. And the question was simply this. If you could somehow acquire a superhero power a power of any kind, any way, shape, or form, what would that power be? Well, I received a lot of responses, and I kind of separated those responses into two categories. The whimsical, you know, the funny, the maybe we're just joking around, and then the serious ones, the righteous ones, the ones that maybe have some moral or ethical values to them. So I want to take you through just some of the responses. I'll start with the whimsical ones. Whimsical. Someone said that they want to be able to create objects with their mind. They just want to be able to think objects into existence in their mind. That, that'd be a neat, neat skill, right? Um, someone said that they want to be able to persuade people while invisible. I kept thinking about naked for some reason. I don't know why I kept going back to naked, but I, I, I'm sure that says something about me. But anyway, persuade people while you're invisible. Pastor Matt of Summit Baptist Church responded, and he said he would like to see the Chicago Bears win all games. I texted him back, and I said I assured him that there was not that kind of power, even if we used our imagination. (laughs) Someone said that they want to have a mute button for annoying people. Maybe you're thinking about muting me right now, but if someone's annoying, you just hit the button. Time travel, premonition to be able to see the future. A man, this would have to be a man, said he wants the hammer of Thor. (laughs) Okay, maybe not a man, that's right. (laughs) To be able to crush anything that stands in his or her way. And then finally, someone said they want to possess all known knowledge. I don't know why that's make-believe. I know some people that know everything, right? We all do, right? Val raised her hand. On the serious side, on the other hand, on the serious side, uh, someone said they want to end or stop evil. Someone said they want to be able to cure illnesses or heal, change bad to good, stop suffering, save lost souls, forgive forgiveness. That's that's really a, a prayer that we should all have. Protect the helpless or create life from death. Those are pretty serious. But if we're going to consider about getting these these superhuman powers, I think there's some things that we really need to think about before we do that. Number one, should we consider the motivation behind behind receiving these powers? I mean, is it an intrinsic motivation, something that I'm going to do just for me? Or is it going to be an extrinsic motivation, something I do for the benefit of other people or maybe all of mankind? Secondly, we should probably consider what having this kind of power would do. I mean, we know that with power comes responsibility, but what so often comes with power is corruption. So we should probably consider 
that aspect of it. We should consider who gets to get these powers. I mean, do you sign up? Is there an interview process? Is there an application to fill out? Is it based on age or experience? I mean, who gets these powers? And while those are some considerations, we have to go deeper than that. Here's a question I kind of have for you this morning. If this was true, if I somehow had a magic wand and could do this for you, give you these superhuman powers, would you really accept them? <laughs> well, my sermon's over. I mean, given a moment of clarity and, and, and a, an opportunity to really consider the ramifications, not only for you, but for other people in the world, realizing the impact that you may have on humanity, because even if you do these things for good, you are going to impact humanity in a great way. Would you accept these powers? But before you answer that question, I have to tell you that there's some further considerations you have to make. Because if I give you these powers, there's a few things I'm going to give you as well. Number one, I promise you that by accepting these powers, you will experience great pain. Either for yourself or for someone else. As a result of these powers, you will suffer. As a result of these powers, someone that you know and love will have to die. There'll be a payoff. You cannot use these powers for your own benefit. They're not there for you. You can only use them for the benefit of others. And here's the kicker. What if I told you, in case you didn't realize it, that you were in no way equipped to handle this kind of power? So the question this morning is this. Would you, an ordinary person, and I say ordinary with every respect to each and everyone's individuality, but would you, as an ordinary person, be willing to step into circumstances and with superhero-type powers produce extraordinary results that are not necessarily for your individual benefit? And now I want you to realize that that's exactly what was asked of Mary. Mary was posed with that very question. She was asked to step out in her ordinary body and do extraordinary things. I want to talk about Mary for just a second and kind of give you a, a better understanding of who she is. First of all, Mary, as the text indicates and as we study the history of it all, was between 12 and 15 years of age. Is there anyone, late, young ladies, that are here between 12 and 15? If you'd stand up, I don't want to embarrass you. Is there anybody up here? No? There's a young lady, 12 to 15 years of age. Thank you. Mary was 12 to 15 years of age, and she had this power thrust upon her. It, it, our text also says that Mary, that Mary was a virgin. Now, we understand what that means sexually, but let's understand and let's read between the lines. What that is indicating is that she was innocent that she was not of the world, that she hadn't experienced things, that she was wet behind the ears, that she was unknowledgeable of so many things. The text also indicates that she was poor. Mary was poor. She was nobody of consequence. Yes, she was in the lineage of David, but her family was poor. She was poor. She was nobody special. We also know that Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. She was just beginning her life. She had all these plans, I'm sure, as any young woman does, uh, impending their first marriage. All these plans of the future. Maybe she had children in mind. Maybe a, a new house, a, a large family, whatever it was. She was just beginning tomorrow, today. And then the last thing I want you to realize about Mary is the text says that she was from Nazareth and Galilee. Now, I know we have this great thought of Nazareth and Galilee. We think this is a great place, but it wasn't at the time. Nazareth in Galilee was a small little town, about 400 people, and it was right on the edge of heathen territory where all those Gentiles lived. And it was actually known as the Galilee of the Gentiles. It was poorly thought of. And so we have Mary, this innocent 12-year-old girl from a small, ill-thought-after town who has an opportunity to really start a life with a new husband, and in the midst of an 
in the midst of all of that, all of that promise, all of that innocence, an angel of the Lord named Gabriel shows up to talk to her. Now, understand there's even more to know about the story. This story, this New Testament story, is written on the edge of 400 years of silence from God. There's something called the intertestamental period, which is between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there was 400 years of total silence from God. He didn't work in a magnificent way in the world as far as we know. He didn't speak to people. Prophets didn't prophesy. There wasn't scriptures written during that period of time. 400 years of absolute silence. And here's Mary, this innocent little 12-year-old girl who's got all these plans. And this angel of the Lord named Gabriel shows up. Now, she would have known about Gabriel because of the Old Testament scriptures and the Old Testament stories. Gabriel, as told by Ezekiel, was the one who was going to destroy Jerusalem. Gabriel was the one who helped Daniel interpret his dreams. And Gabriel was always present in the Old Testament when God had something really, really, really important to say. There was Gabriel delivering the message. Okay, so let's really just put all that together. So here's this tiny little girl, 12-year-old girl from this inconsequential town who sits on the edge of 400 years of silence from God, who has a visit from the Lord, from the angel Gabriel, and he shows up and says, Greetings, you who are highly favored. Now, Chuck. I told Chuck I was going to pick on him. I, I try not to do this. But Chuck, I show up at your house, and you haven't seen me for a very, very, very long time. It wouldn't be 400 years because you're not quite that old yet, but it would be a long time. So I show up at your house after a long time, and I start giving you compliments. Chuck, you're looking good, brother. Man, it's been a long time. Chuck, Chuck, I'm so glad to see you. What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> what does he want? disappointed me, Chuck. <laughs> That's right. W what do you want? What do you want? In fact, the text says that Mary was greatly troubled. Ha, don't you think? Don't you think? And then he says, hey, you are highly favored. Think back through your Bible history about people who have been highly favored by God. It doesn't usually end real well. Noah, you are highly favored by God. Hey, can you build this boat in like the middle of the desert while all these people are making fun of you and throwing rocks at you? And then can you gather up a whole bunch of animals and just sit there and wait for it to rain? It didn't rain on the earth during Noah's time. Or how about Moses? Moses, you are highly favored. God really likes you. Can you lead about two million of your counterparts out of Egypt and oh, know that as soon as you start leading them, they're going to complain and they're going to, they're, they're going to yell at you and they're going to call you names and then you're going to come to this ocean and I'm going to have to split it? Yeah, right, God. And all the while, these Egyptians are going to be chasing you. Can you do that for me? But you're highly favored. Daniel, you're highly favored, you know. Keep, keep, keep hanging in there with God. You might get thrown in the lion's den. You're highly favored. Do you think Mary thought it was a, a great thing to be highly favored? But this angel of the Lord shows up to Mary and she says, You are highly favored. Are you on board with all of this, Mary? Now, we kind of had a discussion in our, in, in our Advent class this morning, which was kind of funny, because we kind of talked about this very thing. And, and there was only four of us, but we unanimously said, absolutely not. You know, uh, Mary, God hasn't spoken for over 400 years. He likes you and notices you. So he's asking you to throw away your entire life, your entire reputation, your hopes for peace, your hope for your future. And he wants you to have this illegitimate child by this thing called the Holy Spirit. He didn't know what the Holy Spirit was. That's an ax. That's a couple books away. You want me to get pregnant by this thing called the Holy Spirit, but I want you to know that eventually this child will be murdered. Now, how did Mary know that? Read the Old Testament. There's over 300 prophecies about Jesus, and about half of them are about how he's going to suffer. Read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. He says he's going to suffer a horrible, horrible death. This, this king, we're going to call the Messiah. So this is a question that Mary is faced with. And the angel says, hey, are you down with that, Mary? So Mary says, 
Okay. Now let me ask a question of the mothers out here. Let's be honest. And, and fathers, if you want to put yourself in this position too, I mean, that's, that's great. But mothers, let's pretend that I had this magical power that tomorrow you could come to the church and, and I would give anyone who wanted a baby boy. You wouldn't have the pain of childbirth and none of that stuff, regardless of your age, regardless of where you are in life. You came tomorrow, ladies, and I would give you a baby boy, but only on the set of conditions that you know that the child's going to grow up and then be murdered. And not for you, not for him, but for all people, which includes those Gentiles that you don't like. Can I see a show of hands, mothers? How many would say, hey, pick me? But that's what Mary said. Mary said, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me as you have said. I am a servant of the Lord. Now, when we take that word servant, we think about it as somebody who's just going to do something for you. Maybe wait on you a little bit, bring you a cup of coffee, maybe clean your house, but it meant so much more. And right there is where we start to see a little bit about who Mary really, really was. And this is what I want to talk to you about this morning. I don't, I don't want to talk about the Christmas story and how it happened, because we know how it happened. We all know the stories. I don't want to talk about how or why it happened, because we all know why it happened. We talk about salvation in Jesus and so forth. We know why it happened. But I want to talk to you today about the characteristics that Mary had that allowed it to happen. Because this is what's important for us. This is the part of the Christmas story that we want to understand today. What characteristics did Mary have that allowed the Christmas story to happen? And so to that, I answer, Mary had a servant's heart. Slide, please. Mary had a servant's large, she, she, heart. She replies to the angel Gabriel, I am the Lord's servant. Now that word servant, you need to know, is a Greek word, doule. And doule doesn't mean servant like we just discussed. Doule means a slave. What Mary says here is, I am a slave of God. Now think about that for a second. We, we have some history in the United States with slavery, and so we know what slavery means. To be a slave means your life is not your own anymore. You don't make decisions for yourself. The person that owns you makes decisions for yourself. If they want to treat you kindly, they treat you kindly. If they want to treat you poorly, they treat you poorly. If they want you to have children, you have children. If you don't, if they want you to eat. But Mary says, I am a slave of the Lord. She wasn't saying that I'd be helpful, I'll do what I can. I'll donate an hour a week. I'll put in $5 in the plate. I'll mow the lawn if nobody else will do it. She says, I'll be a slave to God. Now, Jesus talks about this in Mark. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to the, the 10th chapter of Mark, Jesus talks about what it means to be a servant, a doule, a slave. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. This is kind of that scene where the disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, we want to sit on your right hand. And they're arguing, who's going to be you know, your best man, so to speak? Who's going to be your chosen one? And Jesus says, you know what? You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. See, that's what we think about being in charge. That we lord over someone. But Jesus says, it's just the opposite. You have to be a servant. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus tells us that to be a servant means to be a slave, and that you give up everything that you have, and everything that you are, and any hopes and dreams that you may have made, and you listen to what God wants you to do. And this is exactly what Mary agreed to when she said, I am the Lord's slave. So Mary had a servant's heart. Now if you think about what it takes to have a servant's heart, it means that you have to trust in whoever your master is. 
So Mary trusted God. She says, may it be as you have said. You know, I mentioned the slavery in the United States a little bit earlier, and my son and I were having a conversation a couple weeks ago because he was studying this in school. And I know it's hard to believe, but a lot of our textbooks that kids read in high school and even in college aren't completely accurate. I know that's hard to believe. You heard it here first. Well, one of the things that he and I spoke about is, is the fact that when the, you know, the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation came about and all of that, and suddenly the slaves were freed, that a lot of the slaves didn't leave the plantations. They stayed exactly where they were. Because believe it or not, not every plantation owner treated their slaves poorly. Not everybody beat them and whipped them and cobbled them and did all, hobbled them, all those things that we read about. A lot of them realized that in order to get the maximum amount of work out of people, you had to treat them fairly and nicely and feed them. So a lot of the slaves didn't leave their plantation owners. They stayed right where they were, and they continued working. Now, the only way that could happen is if you trusted your owner. They were slaves, but they trusted their owner. Mary trusted God. There's a story about a newlywed couple who, who were on their honeymoon. They decided to go on a, um, a boat, on a big pond, if you will. So they get on the boat, and they're rowing across the pond, and they're having a grand old time, when suddenly this huge and nasty storm blows in. And the boat starts tossing and turning, and water's rushing over the sides, and it's raining, and it's lightning, and it just seems really, really bad. And the woman, she's beginning to panic. She's really getting stressed. She's really worried. You know, something bad's going to happen. And the guy's just sitting over there, you know, arms crossed, looking around. Finally, it kind of gets to the woman. She says, honey, you know, I mean, what's the deal here? I'm stressed. I'm worried. Bad things are going to happen. Why are you just sitting over there like nothing's going on? Well, the husband gets up from the boat and kind of moves closer to his wife, and he reaches in his pocket, and he takes out a pocket knife. He opens it up, and he puts it to her throat. And he says, honey, are you worried that I might hurt you or kill you? She says, well, no. I know that you love me. I know that you would never do anything to hurt me. I trust you. And the man said, that's exactly how I feel about this storm. I know that God is in control of this storm. And I know the God that I serve doesn't want anything bad to happen to me. And while this storm may seem bad right now, God will take care of it. That had to have been the idea that Mary had. She knew that while everything seemed bleak right now, that somehow this was going to work for good. That somehow God was going to make something extraordinary come out of these really, really difficult situations. Now, we're pretty good at trusting God when the refrigerator's full, the car starts, we got a job, we got money in the bank, the roof's not leaking, nobody's sick, nobody's dying. It's easy to say I trust God for my next meal when you can walk to the refrigerator and get it. But can we admit that sometimes that trust wavers when the refrigerator's empty, when we lose our jobs? and the car won't start, and the roof does leak, and the kids are out of control, and the bank account's empty. Mary was in that situation, and yet she trusted God. Now, there's one more aspect of Mary that I really want you to know about, and it's kind of, it's kind of like icing on the cake, and if, if you'll put some thought into it with me, you'll understand just how difficult it is. You see, Mary has a thankful heart. Now, I did not have Wendy read it, because it was, would have been too long. But I want to read to you what happens in the 46th verse, verse of this same first chapter of Luke. So Mary goes off to see Elizabeth. She's kind of checking on the story. And, and she, Elizabeth is pregnant. Their, their baby's leap in their wombs. And she, she's really solidified into all this is happening to her. She realizes that, that what the angel said is absolutely true. Now some of us might be, oh no, well, geez, what he said really is true. But Mary sings a happy song. Mary sings what is known as Mary's song, and it goes like this. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. 
He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. That's right. Even when Mary confirms what the angel Gabriel said, after she visits Elizabeth, she sings a happy song to God. Now, come on, man. How many of us could sing a happy song in the midst of that? We all know that person that, that regardless of when they pray, even when the world is falling apart around them, they start off and they say, Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for everything I have. Thank you that my roof is leaking. Thank you that my car won't start. Thank you that I'm broke. Thank you I don't have no dinner. And come on, they're annoying. See a few heads being honest and shaken. They're annoying. But this is what Mary did. She says, have, have a thankful heart. And I have to believe that what Mary realized and what I want you to realize today is that if all of this stuff is happening, it means that God is with you and it's part of His plan. And what an honor it is to serve God even when things are bad. Mary found it an honor to be part of God's huge plan. Now, she did that in spite of the fact that it probably wasn't what she would have wished for. Paul in Acts 26.2 says to King Agrippa, he's in, he's in front of the proconsulate, possibly facing death, possibly facing um, imprisonment. He says, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews. I consider myself fortunate, God, for all the bad things that are happening in my life because I trust you and I'm your slave. So what I want you to learn from the Christmas story today is that we do have superhuman powers. It's kind of how we started. I want to bring us full circle. We wished for superhero powers. You have been given them already. You possess them. God gives them to each of you if you will but use them. You have the power of servanthood. You have the power of trust. And you have the power to be thankful that you are part of God's plan. Those are your superhuman, superhero powers. And with them, you can accomplish anything in this world that God has for you to accomplish. You just got to use them. And start, stop wishing for something that you already have. Now, John Lowe, I want to thank John Lowe. He sent me a, a little comic strip this week and. I mean, he had no idea what my sermon was going to be about, but he sent me this little comic strip. Or actually, no, it was Kelvin. It was Kelvin, that's who it was. Kelvin Bernhardt, I'm sorry. John always sends me stuff, that's why I went back to John. <laughs> so Kelvin sends me this, this comic strip, and I want to read it to you because it's kind of small print. But here's a good, it starts up in the upper left-hand corner, and there's this, I don't know, some kind of superhero in the sky, and he's fighting off one of them, I don't know, you know them, I don't know, Godzilla movies with the flying, ah! He's fighting off one of them, and this man and this boy are sitting there, and the man says, cool. And the boy says, I wish we had powers. And so they're sitting there thinking. And the man says, uh, see that sad-looking guy with the ugly hat? I'm down here on this second from the left up. Now it says, watch. Hey, your hat is awesome, and you're awesome for wearing it. And the man says, oh, um, thank you. And the older man says, now look at his face. And he turns to the boy and says, we all have powers. And the boy says, cool. That's what I want you to know about the Christmas story. It's about accepting the power that God has given you and doing great things in his kingdom and for other people. Let us finish with a prayer. Father God, we thank you for the story of Mary. We thank you that she was just a young, innocent girl, poor girl from an ill-thought-after town. We thank you that we're made aware of the plans that she had for her future. But most of all, we thank you, Lord, that we can see that she was a slave to you, that she was willing to trust you, and she was willing to be thankful for whatever you gave her. 
Because in that, Lord, we see a reason for our lives. We realize that we too have the power to move forward and be a part of your plan. And that the Christmas story isn't just about four weeks, it's about the rest of our lives. It's about every minute that we can live to serve you and to serve others. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. And all the Lord's people say, Amen. We are going to move into our last song, but before we start singing, I want to make you aware that we started last week with communion, and last week we brought it to you. This week, communion will be offered 